I'm listening. Alex, I think you might have a hot mic. Just heads up. All right, um, yeah, so we're live on Discord and we're live on YouTube. I'm just getting, got to go find Microsoft Teams, just falling off of its bicycle again. Training wheels, I don't know what the deal is. Okay. Um, all right. We're good. Uh, who's over there, Russ? We're good on teams, right? And I'm going to drop the uh, link from YouTube. I'll drop it on the Discord chat. Okay, um, there's the link on the Discord channel. All right, and then um, I'm going to drop it. I'm dropping it into Teams, into the Teams chat. Should do the trick. Okay. Yeah, it's always a little bit of a slow, slow go getting everything going here. <clears throat> All right. Um, so number one, how's everybody doing? Doing okay? Any quick updates? Everybody, we have, uh, there are a couple of uh, confirmed COVID cases in my classes, other sections. Um, I do wonder if we're, if it's a little premature to be back face to face for most of the classes. You know, I don't know. I do wonder. Um, on the other hand, actually, let's talk about this for a second. On the other hand, um, there's just such a cost to the ongoing isolation, you know, that's, that's a real thing. So I don't know. Um, any, what are you, what are your thoughts on that as students? Do you feel like it's, do you feel like it's better to be back, you know, and take our chances? Um, of course you're young and immortal. I'm old and <laughs> decrepit. Um, you know, but I, anyway, I'm, I'm a little torn. I'm a little torn. Uh, just curious, if, you know, if you have any, I'm tracking most of the comments are coming through on Discord. Um, yeah, I was saying maybe just wanted it online still. I did know there were a lot of, a lot of students that I knew that were, that had literally said, um, you know, Cassidy said maybe with the Delta variant, you know, maybe we're back too early. And it's, it's a, I don't know. I don't have the answer, right? I don't, I don't claim to have any, you know, omniscient insight into any of that. Um, you know, I, I do know that there were at least a couple of students in one or one of my face-to-face -face classes that literally said, 
if this was if this had been online again, I would have taken the semester off because just you know need everybody's different, everybody learns differently. Um, um, anyway, yeah, just kind of curious where you're at on that. Um, you know, this class is of course online. <clears throat> there's some there's some nice advantages to that. Frankly, I'm in my home office. <laughs> you know, uh, it. It's nice. So, um, yeah. Uh, let me see. Yeah, Daniel just said opinions depend on individual preference. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you can't, you cannot make everybody happy. There's not, it's not possible. Um, Garrett says online sucks sometimes, takes away the nice social interaction. Agreed. I agree, it does. And then sometimes it's a big advantage. So um, let's see, we continue our, I, I want to give you, I, I got a couple things. And this is this class is so low commitment. Um, you know, it's so low commitment that I, I'm not feeling super bad about everything. But I had um, this, uh, it was a tenure notebook, actually. So not too big of a deal, you know, the way, the way tenure works in academia is that you, um, if you don't, if you don't get tenure, then you don't keep your job, you know, so it's a little bit of a big deal. And it was due Wednesday night at midnight. And then with this section being a fourth section, and then I picked up a fifth section, I think I told you about, um, and it, my, that one has been just such a time suck. And Anyway, I just, I didn't get it done on time. So maybe they'll fire me. I don't know. But I finally get that done Saturday night at midnight. Um, in the meantime, for the last week, I've had only one thing on my to-do item other than be in class. I didn't even get that done 100% of the time. But it was just get this thing, get this tenure notebook done. As a byproduct, I am backlogged on chat, email, everything. Um just so you know that it's that I'm not ghosting you on purpose, you know, but there is a lineup. There is a uh, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, about twenty people with where I've got uh, uh, badges. What do they call them? Notifications <sighs> that I haven't gotten to. So it's, it's been just, if you've been trying to get a hold of me on Discord or any mechanism, just, just understand I've not been available on account of this job thing. But anyway, well, and mostly on account of picking up the fifth section. Okay. Let's see. So BB Goose said, I like in person, but loved having recorded lectures, really struggle getting things first time. So being able to go back and take really in-depth notes, save my bacon last semester. That's fair enough. And everybody, you know, everybody hits it differently. I'm going to, by the way, anyone actually make use of a back scratcher? Because I just had a moment um, and I got to do it because if otherwise I'm just going to sit here and suffer. Um, okay, let's, I have a list of our topics of coolness. Remember that this topic has, this thing has been shared with everybody. In fact, let me just do it again and drop that into the chat. Just, just as a refresh to let you know, you can drop the topics in. Okay. Um, and just love to have, you know, the, we're doing this because it's required. We know why we're doing this, right? And um, I, my job and my goal is to hopefully make it just a little bit of fun and a little bit of value and not overall super painful. So, um, all right, that's topics of coolness and everything kind of up top is where I'm, is where we're, where we currently are. Let me hit, um, let me just kind of start in on these. Um, I want I did want to talk about the imposter syndrome. I hope everything we've been doing has been helpful so far, you know, and, and some value, but I think that the, the imposter 
syndrome. By the way, some I just feel like something crazy is going on with my hair. Uh, I don't know what it is. It just feels wrong somehow. I could throw a hat on. <laughs> I don't have one right here with me. I don't know. Just does that? Is anybody else seeing this? Um. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Don't pander to me. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trolling, you know, for comments, you know, for, for praise. I just honestly, um, you know, I was just bucking me. Imposter syndrome. Okay. Here's the thing about imposter syndrome. First of all, there's gradations. As with anything, there are gradations by which I mean that, um, that there's, you know, a, a spectrum, a continuum, right? And, and I would make the argument that there is, okay, I wouldn't even make the argument. This is sort of accepted in the psychological community, in the psychiatric, psychology, psychological, um, uh, literature that there is on the extreme end an imposter syndrome, which is essentially debilitating. It is, you know, it becomes a serious um, emotional, mental health problem. So, and I think that what we're talking about is mostly not that. There's a lot of literature and study and research about that extreme version of, of imposter syndrome. Um, well, what I'm talking about is something that, that pretty much everybody goes through and I think really, truly everybody goes through, as soon as you become credentialed, you, f you start to feel like you have some, yeah, some inconsistency in terms of what you've been credentialed. You have your undergrad degree or um, what I, where I experience it every, so I have a PhD, as you know, if you want to talk about imposter syndrome, that's a good one, right? When you, you get that degree and one of the things that happens, my own theory about imposter syndrome is that when you actually get a degree or get something, you know, some kind of um, credential, by the time you get the credential, you're good at it already. So then you already know you're good at it. So if you're in a if you're in a dissertation uh, defense PhD dissertation defense with your committee, right? And it's the committee are all the PhDs, and they're the ones who are going to vote whether they're going to let you in the club. But who's the sub? Um, let me throw this out. When you're in that meeting, who is the subject matter expert? If I'm defending my dissertation, and I have a group of professors, who's the subject matter expert? You are. That's right, Tyler. If I'm in that group and I'm defending my dissertation to a bunch of um, professors, I am the subject matter expert. Because, and nobody, and honestly, there's no professor in there that can, in practice, be as fluent at the, uh, you know, at the material as I am. And, and that's really an important thing, I think, to, to understand. Um, and then what happens is then they put this, you know, this degree on you and put the robe on you and, you know, put the fancy hat and whatever. And you don't feel like you, like anything really happened. You know, you don't feel any different, you know, fundamentally, you're glad to be done, but then you feel like you're walking around and you have this title and people look at you different or they treat you different. Um, you become a professor. People call you professor. They call you doctor somebody, you know. And and I, I so here's my kind of quick story. And I'm just curious about any other experiences you had with that. If you don't mind dropping those, it, it, it really feeds the conversation. But um, I had a situation when I was on faculty at BYU. And I joined the faculty when I was 40. And I remember being in my early 40s, and at this point, it had been, you know, maybe five years since I had defended my dissertation. And um, anyway, I just remember feeling that, that 
like even looking back at my dissertation and just feeling like that just sucked and like it wasn't that good. I would have never passed me if I, if I had been my own advisor, if, if future Chuck, you know, could have been the advisor for, for past Chuck's dissertation, I would have, and it's true that there are some things I would have required that my advisor didn't require of me that I think would have been better for me to have done. Um, but so what I finally did one day, it was making me crazy. The imposter syndrome was making me crazy because I thought I was a fraud. Like my dissertation was like, you know, blank sheets of paper, you know, <laughs> like it's 300 pages and everything. But anyway, so I read it. I just sat down one day and I just reread it from the beginning to the end. And when I was done, I was like, huh, that's not that bad. You know, I would have done a couple things differently had I been the advisor of a student who did that dissertation, I would have required more of a certain variety. But looking back on it, I'm like, was it in my objective old man eyes, you know, was my dissertation worthy of a doctorate? And I would go, yeah, yeah, it's not the best dissertation I've ever seen. It's not the best dissertation I ever advised. In fact, all the dissertations I advised were better than the one that I defended as a, as a grad student. Anyway, so if you, if you, what has been your experiences with this in terms of imposter syndrome? Is it more like somebody asks you, they think you've had a few CS classes and then they're going to have you work on a project and they think you know stuff and you actually really don't? Is that, is that it? Um, just curious what, what other things were showing up. And I hope the stories, you know, help you just a little bit. Got a few people typing on Discord, but. Um, and by the way, there is a thing where. Um, oh, four by four teachers giving assignments and then you feeling that you don't know enough to be able to do them. Or is it the teacher feeling that you don't know enough? Help me understand that one better. Okay, yeah, you not knowing enough. So yeah, you got to give me some other examples on that. Um, Because, okay, being overwhelmed by the assignments. Interesting. So what's the imposter component? Like, I must be a fraud because I should know this by now? You know what I wonder about? I wonder if there's not an element of the orders of ignorance at play in that. Um, and we really haven't gone deep. It's something that I do... Oh, that everyone else in the class will finish in the next 20 minutes. Uh, let me read Hunter. One that's tough is how every job needs X years of experience, <laughs> right? Or they need they need 10 years of experience in a technology that's only four years old. Um, like even entry-level ones are asking for something like four years. No, that's bull crap. Um, makes me feel like they want an expert, even though it's supposed to be entry-level. Makes me doubt what I've learned. Okay, that's interesting. So Hunter... Makes me doubt what I've learned and the classes I've taken. No, you know what's interesting about that? Uh, there is a part where, see, that that clinically extreme version of the imposter syndrome, the challenge with that individual and the struggle is they are crippled by, like really, truly crippled. Um, it's debilitating. They're crippled by self-doubt. The self-doubt is so strong. But here's my question that I'd maybe throw at you. Um, in any given situation, there's a half decent chance that somebody's wrong, right? You know, that somebody would be wrong. Why should that be you? See what I mean? Why should that, why should that somebody who is wrong need to be you? Why can't it be them? Um, 
Now there's a, and I didn't really get to this, but at the other end, like here's my spectrum, right? And this is the, the clinically, the clinical imposter syndrome. If you're at a point where you're clinically the opposite extreme, where you never doubt yourself, you might be dealing with, you know, narcissistic personality disorder or something, you know, over on, on that other end, because it's natural and healthy to have a certain amount of self-doubt and it's natural and healthy to have a certain amount of self-confidence and, and life is this mix. Um, you know, I, I do think, and then, and then of course the personalities are different and our life experiences are different and we're all on these different journeys, but, but it's that healthy middle somewhere in this bell curve where it gets really extreme on the ends. Right. Um, but you got to start by asking yourself, maybe they're just wrong. Maybe their whole approach, right? Hunter, you know, maybe, maybe they're the ones that are screwed up. That I think is an important idea. Um, Cause I think that when people want that, then they're just delusional. And maybe that's not a company that you want to work for. And it's hard to have enough confidence in yourself to be just like, you don't deserve my skills. <laughs> you know, I got these mad skills and you don't deserve them. Let me hit some of the others. Um, Austin said, the problem is that CS is such a broad field with so much to know. And so I feel like what I know is just to drop in the ocean. Correct, by the way, that is correct. Um, despite learning so much, yeah. And by the way, that only gets worse, right? You get old, you get a PhD, and you know even less. The, the ocean got bigger while your drop kind of, your drop got bigger, but the ocean got bigger. The real knowledge is the ability to learn. And I think that's what a lot of us fail to realize. And I think that's right on. Um, in fact, given that one another thumbs up, but I, I do think that that's, I think that's really key, Austin, um, that, that I think a lot of you do fail to realize that the number one, you, you understand that nothing that we taught you is, you know, almost nothing is going to be the thing in 50 years or 40 years or 20 years or 10. You know, there's so much that's going to change. It's always changing. So much is going to change. So it's not about knowing the answer, which is about the orders of ignorance. And I don't know how many of you have had my, my speech either in 3450, 4450, 305 G. If you've been in any of those classes with me and a short version in uh, 2810, you've we've talked about the orders of ignorance um which is really about becoming comfortable with um becoming comfortable with not knowing crap you know just kind of being okay not knowing because there's also a process by which you do know by which you learn by which you gain and one of the things i remember talking about and some of you had 2810 from me. But one of the things that shocked me early on was when I had students, when I had a large project. And students were like, I don't even know how to start, you know, and which is, I think it's a boneheaded statement, you know. I don't know how to start. You've been in class the entire semester. You've been doing the homework taking the module exams. And then I say, now I'm going to have you do a really big project. I don't even know how to start. No, you don't know how to finish. You do know how to start, right? You don't have to know the end, but I think that we feed you so much knowledge in little bites that you always, that you tend to get into a habit of thinking somehow that, um, Life asks you bite-sized questions and you deliver pre-distilled bite-sized answers. But there's nothing really that looks like that. Those bite-sized answers are already being served up by Google or, you know, DuckDuckGo. What is that? What is that? Browser. Not browser. Search engine. Is it DuckDuckGo? You know what I mean? Engineering work is where somebody throws a big pile of crap at you and you look at it and you're like, huh, well, let's see 
what do I make of this? What's my goal again? Polish it into earrings. Got it. You know what I mean? You do know how to start things, but you don't, none of us know how to finish things. None of us know how to end things, right? You need to write an email. How do you start it? I don't even know how to start Of course you do, but you don't know what the whole thing is going to be when you're done. So just saying, I think that, that what, um, what Austin said is really, I think so far Austin wins the chat. Um, I think it's quite profound and important. And, and understand that your ability to learn, learning how to learn, the number one thing you can do in this major, you're going to get a bunch of foundational ideas, but mostly you're going to learn how to learn. Um, Tyler said, I dislike how some instructors are treating you like an employee and just tell you to figure it out yourself. Um, I get the merit of being self-talk, but I don't talk, but I don't feel like school is the place to enforce that. Let me, so Tyler, that's a really, I think it's really an important point. I'm going to push back a little bit, just a little bit. Okay. Um, cause the question, and I think you, you spoke to it. The question is one of where do you draw the line? And I think are we, we can agree with that, right, Tyler, that the question is not that one should, you know, cause I don't think you're saying, I, I, truly don't think you're trying to say, when well, when well, change my diaper, spoon feed me, bottle feed me, burp me and put me to bed. This is Chuck's metaphor for, you know, expecting the te- that the teacher is going to spoon feed you everything and you don't have any responsibility. Pretty confident it's not what you're saying. And again, we're dealing with some end of the spectrum, right? One is that burp me, <laughs> burp me, bottle feed me, you know, put me to bed, my little nappy time. And, and then there's another one, which is like, throw me to the wolves. And it's like, well, I could have done that myself. Right, Tyler. Um, and right. So then the follow-up from Tyler, I'm doing the Tyler thread right now. Um, you said true, but part of self-learning is seeking help appropriately. Absolutely. Right. Sometimes it's asking the person who knows, and then taking the giant step of asking for help. Some teachers, some teachers, not all, seem to have a, it's not my problem to help you. And I agree that's a problem. I think that, because I here's, okay, I'm going to say just a couple of things, Tyler, and then I'm going to move on to the other comments. But I had an experience just this weekend where I've got this backlog of comments, you know what I mean? Just creaming me from, uh, from I don't know what, from different classes. And I spent, you know, 15 minutes in 2810 on Thursday explaining how you do, well, in the last week, binary math, how you just take number and you add them. I mean, I spent time in class. It was very clear. There's past recordings. There's the book. There's the slides. And they all speak to it. And then there's a comment. And again, if you're if you're in the class and you're the guy that dropped the comment, I'm not trying to you know single you out because I'm not naming anybody. But the behavior did kind of just shock me a little bit, which was kind of like, what do I do in this situation? And it's not like I don't understand the fundamental concept or something I'm not getting. It's something very operational that we talked about over and over and over again. Then I don't know if this is somebody who was there and is trying and has done everything they can, and then they just still don't get it. And I'll spend endless time with that student. Or if it's a situation where somebody hasn't bothered, I mean, I've had people ping me for like, hey, where's the, how do we do the one thing, you know? I'm like, were you there on the first day of class and did you read the syllabus? Oh, I guess I should probably read the syllabus. Yeah, you probably should. Were you there on the first day of class? No, I missed I missed the first day of class. You know? Well, you know, you didn't you didn't come to the first day of class, you didn't hit the recordings, you didn't read the syllabus, you know, whatever. You know what I'm trying to say? There is a part where, and this is the hard part, Tyler, is as a teacher, and again, your mileage may vary, but as a teacher, finding the proper balance, you know what I mean? Um, 
finding finding the balance with because there are questions that really look like someone's asking for a diaper change and really and you have to ask yourself you put all this effort in to create an environment where the material is available you're teaching it and if something that fundamental you know you know what i'm trying to say because there is, and the other thing too, Tyler, is that there is an aspect where figuring out how to jump in and, and understand it. But here's what I would recommend. Global recommendation to everybody. I recommend that if you're going to go to a teacher who's like that, what I'll bet you is going on. Now, that this is, this is you know, Dr. K's educated guess about what's going on. Um, more than likely what you're dealing with is a teacher, typically an older teacher. And I only say that because sometimes the older teachers get a little cynical because they've seen it all. And they're just bothered by students who don't seem to take any accountability. And so one way around that is you say, hey, Dr. K, um, listen, there's a concept I'm just not getting. I've read the book. I've hit the slides. I've rewatched the lecture. And it's, there's just probably something I'm not getting. Could I get five minutes of your time? What you've done is you've told the professor, I'm going to limit my hit on you. I am somebody who takes responsibility. And having done all the things I should have done to help myself, there's still a deficit and I'm sincerely seeking help. I think that you will score most of the time, even with, with, with cranky professors. And if you've got a professor who, when you do that, says, wah, 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 you know, go, go, screw you, <laughs> you know, whatever. Then then you may just have a problem, you know. I don't know. Okay, I'm going to jump. Those are, but these are great questions, and I really appreciate that, Tyler. James, um, finishing a course at UVU like Java, C Sharp, or Python, that means I have to do something at work in said language and feel like, like I don't know anything about the language. Yeah, yeah. I tell you, one of the things that happens, how many of you have um, like studied a foreign language? Um, hang on a second. I actually have somebody at my door, but um, I'm texting them. Almost there. I'm still in class. What's that? Yeah. All right. All right, that's one thing that happens when we're online. <laughs> it doesn't generally happen live in the classroom. Um, yeah, James, okay. How many of you have um, like learned, studied a foreign language and you've really just never broken through? You know, you've never really achieved the fluency. See, I mean, I remember, um, like I studied French in high school for four years, right? And, and I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I mean, it was, it was, it was worthless, you know? So that felt, speaking of imposter syndrome, I felt like a real fraud. And then I wind up on a mission in Italy um, 40 years ago, right? But I become fluent. I really do have the click in the head. But I know people that have, um, you know, served church missions or, or been abroad in some capacity where they were supposed to be Peace Corps or something where they're in a position where they could have learned language 
and then they and but even people and this always surprises me when somebody's like yeah i went to germany on my mission and i like don't speak german like i don't even know how you did that you know um but i know it's a thing so i'm not trying to i'm not trying to denigrate that i'm just saying i know it's a thing there's a lot of imposter syndrome there i think the principle is still true if you can get play with a language enough that it really becomes fluent. You know what I mean? Where you feel like this, just confidence, total confidence about that language and your confidence in the ability to learn what comes next and to just do it open book. The other thing too, James, it's a really good point, but open book, man, have it, have a book nearby. If, if that's the way you work best or a, or a cheat sheet up of, of the syntax or you know, I have to do that with, you know, I started programming in Python just like a year and a half ago. Yeah, yeah. Of, of, of it. But I hadn't really written like my, my own original code in Python until a year and a half ago. I still feel like a complete moron, you know, most of the time. But I do about most things. And there's a point where you just get comfortable. <laughs> you're like, sure, I'm a moron, but you're okay with it. Yeah. Okay. Anthony, uh, quoting Neil deGrasse Tyson, as the area of our knowledge grows, so too does the primitive arguments. Wow. Love it. Love, love, love it. Um, Jack Zach says, it reminds me how in compilers, I was so worried about syntax analysis when I was still on lexical analyzer. I was worried about semantics when I was working on syntax. Right. In other words, whichever one is the one you haven't hit yet is freaking you out. I remember going through that when I was like halfway through my second semester of calculus doing integral stuff that I finally understood derivatives, <laughs> you know what I mean? Where I was just like, Oh, like I wanted to retake calc one. Cause I'm like, wait, I could smoke this now. At the time it was blowing my head. Brandon, um, when I made staff sergeant in the air force back in the day, I had imposter syndrome bad because I was so much younger and more inexperienced compared to the other staff sergeants. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, and that's then that's an environment where confidence is the order of the day, right? Um, it took me a long time to convince myself that I earned it and met all their criteria. Yeah, that's the thing. These are such great comments, you guys. Um, Brandon continues, I think you just have to put yourself out there and accept that any job is going to take time to adapt to. Admitting that you still don't know everything and being willing to ask questions will take you far in a new job. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Giving that one an extra thumbs up. Um, yeah, this is, it's important. And I think it relates to the orders of ignorance and a speech. I can give you some of these speeches if people are interested. Um, but there's some speeches that I give when I talk about the orders of ignorance. But it has to do with being comfortable saying, I don't know. Just being cool with it. You know? And, and paradoxically, the person in the, in the room that, that is most likely to say, I don't know, is probably the person who actually knows because they're always open to new information. They're always learning. So um, let me see. Um, yeah, Jack, can't count to 100. I can count to 100. Still. Actually, what happened was after I got back from Italy, and I was doing a double major in CS and Italian at the University of Iowa with a minor in French. And then my French got actually, because I already, this is interesting, and I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Jack, that um, once I had really mastered Italian, and I'm still very, you know, I'm still fluent in Italian, then all of a sudden it was like easier for my brain to believe that I could be fluent in something else. And then I became pretty fluent in French where I could go to France and, you know, speak with French people and do the thing. Then late in the game, I picked up Spanish and I'm still an absolute fraud. The click has not happened yet in Spanish. Um, James, we can, we can put orders of ignorance on the docket and I think it would be valuable. And for some people who have seen my speech, maybe if you weighed in, you know, even anonymously, if you want to say like, I've seen the speech, it, don't worry about it. It's not going to help you. Um, or I've seen the speech and I could definitely hear it again. Um, 
Oh, Garrett asked, is there any advice that you have in giving feedback to more experienced developers or managing people that are significantly older than you? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, that's a, oh man, that's a good one. Um, let me see. Jonathan said that you did four years of Russian at UVU. Um, so there's a class that return missionaries would go into, right? Like a placement, right? That's what you're talking about, right, Jonathan? Kind of like a placement class, I presume, for anybody with, um, yeah, either in, in Utah, typically be missionaries. I remember a similar thing at Iowa, and there was like me and this other girl that were Italian students, and she had just lived there, and I'd been a missionary. So, but we were both really fluent in Italian and had kind of been, had a certain placement thing and kind of knew each other in the program. But um, yeah, people that had lived there for two years and didn't know how to speak in past tense. These are return missions. That's crazy. That's crazy. Okay. Where was I? Garrett, in, um, what to do? Um, Let me see. Foxhound related to this started asking more and more questions. Does everyone else in the class really have a perfect understanding and no questions, but me, right? In fact, I did that one time where I was at a, in a grad class at Oregon State in my PhD program, and I remember just relates to what you what you were just saying, Foxhound. Um, but at the start of class, I said, "Hey, before we get started, I am just dying on this one part of this one assignment." You know, is anybody else struggling with that? Is anybody else? I could really love to talk about that. There were only like eight students in the class. And literally nobody said, everyone like looked at me and then like looked down at the floor and nobody said a word, you know? And I was like, <laughs> you know? And I'm just like, and the, nobody, teacher, like I'd really broken protocol or something. And then the teacher, everyone's just staring at me. I, all I asked was, you know, anybody else have any questions? I mean, this never, I'm struggling, you know. And I looked around and I'm just like, no. So it's just me. It, I'm, and I looked up at the teacher and I said, I'm apparently the only one who doesn't get this. I'll go jump on that on my own. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry for the interruption. Sorry, everybody. Sorry. As you were. I literally did that. But it's like... <laughs> so I mean, there was no humanity, man. There was no humanity. You know, even just a little bit like, hey, no, I think I understand it, Chuck, but I could, sit, I could walk through it with you a little later. Or, yeah, I struggled too. Nothing. Nothing. Crickets. Pencils drop. Yeah. Okay, back to Garrett. Um, just understand, okay, when I was a manager in an engineering, when I was in a larger company, um, and I'm still a manager, you know, but but typically everybody's got less experience. When I was a manager in a um, larger company, one of my goals always was to try to make sure that half my team made more money than me and had more experience than me. That was always kind of to your point, Garrett, that was always one of my core ideas. Um, for one thing, it just made me be humble. It made me understand that I wasn't the source of all answers. And if you honestly believe, um, I'll draw you a picture, but if you honestly believe that that your company organization here i'm going to draw you incredible artwork it's going to be fantastic okay you're going to like this so what this is trying to reflect is there's the manager in the middle this is the source of all confusion, questions, answers. And then these are all of the answers, okay? There's a the manager in the middle. If that's your organizational structure, you're doomed. You're screwed. 
if that's your organizational structure. This organizational structure, I'll tell you what the order of magnitude of the effectiveness. This is the order of magnitude of the effectiveness of that organization. If you're doing it right, the organizational impact is at least big O of N squared, where N is the number of people in the organization. There's that many more places for great ideas and great solutions and great answers to pop out. This right here, you're just screwed. If the, if the capacity of the entire organization is limited to the capacity of the manager, wow. Wow. Fade. Oh, blocked. Jazz lose again. <laughs> Crap. Um, no. So, so in, in, in short, um, who was asking that question? Garrett, don't presume to know stuff that you don't know. Be, be really open about what you don't know. Be honest in your ignorance. You know, Hey, Hey Biff, tell me what you're doing here. What, what's, tell me what the cool thing is. And as Biff tells you, be okay, not knowing all the things but also have confidence in yourself that you can learn what's going on. You know, you can be like, oh, that's really, really cool. You know, what the number, the worst thing you can possibly do is, is when you're the manager, is act like you know stuff when you don't. That's really transparent. Then you look like a putz. Putz. You will look like a putz and everybody will know you're a poser then you're going to double down on imposter syndrome and it's going to be that much worse. Um, and I'm going to get rid of that off the, uh, the topics of coolness. We're close on time. Um, let me see. Yeah. All right. Let me see. BB goose. Two types of people. People, the ones who are okay with looking dumb and keep putting themselves out there. And then the ones who get to a point where they're comfortable and don't like being uncomfortable. So never really progress. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You have to be, you have to be comfortable with uncomfortableness. I don't even think uncomfortableness is a word. Um, Man, DB Goose, how do I find a balance to keep learning as opposed to being efficient when it comes to assignments? That is tough. That is honestly really, really tough. I don't, I don't have a great answer um, other than you have to make sure that at some point you're learning for learning, that you figure out how to do, you know, pay the man because the man's got to get paid and also do do for yourself, learn for you. And I don't know exactly what that looks like. It's gonna probably be your mileage may vary. Um, James said, just because I understand this, somebody, somebody had said to you, a more experienced developer, just because I understand this language better doesn't mean I'm smarter than you. It just means that I've had more time banging my head against the wall trying to figure it out, to help put into perspective and help you with imposter syndrome, yeah. No, that's right. That's right. And that's wisdom and a level of humility, um, you know, on the part of the individual that said that to you. Um, because anybody who's going to be like, you know, really making a big scene about how they know it and you don't is is a putz. Um, word of the day, putz. P-U-T-Z. Yeah, thank you for the reminder, everybody. Putz. It comes from Yiddish. Well, it doesn't come from Yiddish. It is Yiddish. It comes to English from Yiddish, but it isn't a Yiddish word. Even better if you want to look it up. But yeah, putz. That's our secret word of the day. And you know what? I'm okay ending a minute early. 
I feel like I hope this has been good. Would you please, if you have new to other topics, let's drop them into the uh, into the bin. Okay, on the topics of coolness. I hope this is not an utter waste of your time. I'm trying to make the best with this time that we're all kind of forced to spend and hopefully have it be of some value to everybody. Okay. Ciao tutti quanti. I the link BB Goose, the link for the topics of coolness is is I dropped it up in the chat. And I can redrop it. There's the link, BB Goose, right there for the uh, extra convenience. Thank you for the topics and the questions and the everything. It's great. Bye, my friends. Love you all.